let's jump into our forensic process. And specifically, there's a couple of videos that we're going to jump into, as we mentioned before, through the actual methodology phase of the process phase around digital forensics. And the very first component that we're going to look at is our identification process. And what does identification look like? Uh, and as we sort of start looking at forensics, well, we want to start identifying what we want to connect to and obtain data from, right? So digital devices and evidence in the environment. So where do we typically focus on and how do we collect this data and what do we do about it? So I guess the first question that I kind of have is, well, what evidence should be collected? So a big what, right? And we can collect evidence from any part of the environment, right? We have workstations, uh, we may have laptops, we may have servers, right? We've got firewalls and the list goes on, right? So a lot of the network infrastructure, there's mobile devices, network shares, traffic, like actual network traffic that we can take information off, system logs, uh, et cetera, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that we can obtain and collect these logs and this information from. Now, what should we be collecting? And typically the uh, the what on this side is, um, well, what should we be collecting? So what collecting? Well, typically this comes through our interview process. So when we interview maybe our users or the identification based on what we're going to see as an impact, well, then we can begin to identify, well, what we're going to be collecting based on this process. Now, this helps us identify which devices were involved in activities leading to the investigation. Uh, was it a file share on a specific server and a specific user did some activity? So if I've got a user over here, and they've logged into a laptop and obviously they're working uh, and then they logged into a file share and maybe there's a, and maybe another server somewhere that they've maybe communicated with. We can then begin to collect the data on that specific host. So we know the host name maybe, the host IP, we know the information of that host. Then we know what this server is. So we can start to pinpoint you know, trivial information around well, what we're collecting. Maybe it's this host over here that's just communicating to this web server, for example. So then we only just take data from those two hosts and, and that's it. We don't have to look at other hosts down here who are doing other things or providing other services within the organization. So it, it allows us to be very concise and very specific and very to the point around what information we're going to be collecting and how we're going to filter through that information. So the interviews, when we interview part of that process, the interviews help us to find basically what has happened and what was involved. So usually it's a list of devices containing the evidence and then we go away and collect the evidence from those devices. So the next question that I have is, well, can we collect evidence from anywhere? And the answer is, well, there's a yes and no component to both. And I would say if we brainstorm yes and brainstorm no, we can sort of define, um, you know, we can define what they kind of look like, right? So typically, if it's company owned, now if the company owns the asset and they own, obviously they own the um, the device and they own the infrastructure and stuff like that, well then typically, yes, we collect information from it. Um, you know, the, the company has gone away, they've paid some sort of, uh, you know, services and they're paying for the device. You know, these could be devices like laptops, phones, other, other types of hardware. Uh, and they're paying for it. So if the organization owns this, so the organization slash company own it, then yes, they can go away and do an investigation. Now, the question that I have is, can they do an investigation on personally owned devices? So if you own your own phone or your own laptop, well, here's where the sort of that, that the sort of the gray line kind of comes into play, right? So now, if we have a bring your own device policy in and that policy says, well, based on the company, uh, you know, you're going to be utilizing your own personal phone. And then if the breach occurs, then we, we are subjective to investigations of your personal device. Now, if you've gone away and you have signed that, well, then yes, the company can obviously be subjective to investigations around collecting those assets or collecting those information from your personal devices because you have given them authority through the BYOD policy that's been in place within the organization. Now, 
if you haven't signed that, well, chances are you're probably not going to be subjective to any data collection, right? So again, if there was a law in place where maybe there was a law broken within a specific business or someone has done something against the law, well, then yes, potentially, sure, there will maybe be an investigation process that can happen, but typically it'll go again. Uh, it'll go against through that BYOD policy and ensuring that's been obviously adequately signed. There's an internal process and policy uh, depending on the organization and how they operate with BYOD and mobile devices and their infrastructure. So that's where that sort of that gray line sort of happens there. Now, as we continue our discussion around uh, in identification, there's a couple of things that we also need to be mindful of. And we need to make obviously informed decisions and obviously game plans associated with data identification, how we're going to identify assets across the infrastructure. So let's just say that we have a, a laptop over here and this laptop is accessed by a specific user and then they access some information on a share. Uh, let's say there's a file share here and that's all they're kind of working on. Now, if we have that PC here, for example, and there was an action performed by this machine. So some sort of commit function was done. Maybe it was some sort of data that was stolen. So let's maybe let's maybe define a specific scenario. So I'll let me think of a scenario as we're sort of brainstorming this and I will uh, define this in a bit more detail. So the only thing that I can kind of think of is here is if we have someone who has stolen some data from that PC, right? So if this user is working on something and they've potentially stolen something or they're trying to steal something uh, where they're working from. Well, typically this is a, a local area network, right? So there's a laptop here that's probably connected to the server through a switch port and they can access the files and the resources through the, the, the local area network, right? Well, traditionally when I start looking at this, I would say there's a couple of parameters here that we need to be mindful of. One is the value that this brings. So there's an element of value and we're going to discuss this in a little bit more detail. There's volatility and volatility is all about uh, how long the data gets retained for, right? So when systems run, uh, it basically writes logs to itself, right? So by default, logs uh, can only get so big before it overwrites itself. So let's say the a file writes maybe you know 256 bytes of, of of data to itself. If it over if it gets to that memory part, it will begin overwriting itself of the old logs. So therefore, the old logs are pretty much gone, and we can't find them, so they're overwritten. So volatility kind of happens when uh, there's basically a a short amount of time before the data then is no longer available. So again, it kind of happens around sort of the memory is an example of this. So memory is volatile. If we shut something down or if we reboot something, then we lose the memory information and the memory data is gone, which we can't have that kind of happen when we start talking about forensics, right? Because we want to inspect that, the volatile memory, because uh, chances are there's information in it that we can start looking at. So if the machine has been powered off, then we've lost that information. So being, mo being mindful of volatility could be a another piece of example here, and then obviously effort. So we need to consider effort or level of effort ac across how much effort it takes to get the data off. So let's talk about the value here, and then we'll sort of work our way up this sort of triangle. So let's just say that we've taken some data um, between a, a, obviously the file server here, there's a, a router over here, and then routes to the internet. Well, the first thing that I would look at is, well, if this PC and the value that this PC is using or the data that's been stolen, I would say, well, the value in this case would be high. So I would investigate that um, the information that we've gotten, uh, the firewall that's leading to the internet was not involved in this activity. So the firewall logs are kind of not valuable to us right now. So typically this is on a LAN share and that LAN information is of, of low value to us as well. But the PC, however, and that server logs, well, that's kind of high because there's certain requirements of information on those machines along with potentially the network traffic as well, uh, which in this, in this opinion, or in my opinion right now, would be quite high because that server, so this workstation itself and that file server and potentially that network log of traffic right there, that'll be of high value. So I can then categorize and say, well, the value of that is absolutely high. So then I can take it further and kind of just sort of break this out into sort of maybe another visit, another visit, um, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the word, I'm thinking of the word virtual, but it's not virtual. I'm trying to think of the word as graphical, like let me represent this in another form. Uh, and typically you would grab it like this. So you say there's a bit of evidence here, 
And then the only way I can just do it is if I just write it out like this, I'll segment this out. Then I'll just move those comments that I put into the triangle here. So we've got the evidence. So the evidence is coming from the device of, of reason. So the device that we're going after, there's a bit of value here. So what's the value of the device? And then we've got our volatility. And then we've got our, what was the last part there? Our effort, if I can remember correctly. Um, so yeah, effort, okay, cool. So then we can take that and say, well, if I just draw a line through here. Now, I know this is not the best form, but this is me sort of freehanding and, and spitballing here. So just bear with me as we sort of go through this together. So I will take this and I'll say, okay, well, based on the evidence that we've got from the PC in nature, well, the value is quite high because we've got our network traffic. We've got, so I'm going to put network traffic. We've got the PC and then we've got that server log. So all that information is, um, is quite high. Right, the value is quite sensitive. Put server right here. So, so, so that's quite high. Now, as I continue looking at the volatility, well, let's take that into, con into consideration as well now. So when we start looking at the volatility component, well, how long is that data going to be there for? Right? So we don't know. So it could be a couple of megabytes if we're using the information, a couple of bytes. So it, the volatility component will only be there for a short amount of time. Now, if the, if the PC and the server have the logs, well, the logs are highly volatile, which I would put as a high. So H, and then I'll put logs here. So the logs themselves will be quite high, uh, and both memory as well, because now if this machine has been turned on and the machine is on, that's great, we can preserve that. Now, if the machine has been powered off and it's gone, well, then that could potentially be another issue there. So we, let's just say maybe the memory, um, Let's just say the machine is powered on, the machine is in its actual state, it hasn't been altered, and then we can preserve and we can maybe obtain that volatile memory later. So I can classify that memory information as being quite quite high, so as a high component there. Now the level of effort. Now the level of effort in this case, it's well, firstly is, is a part of some sort of service provider or part of a cloud service. Now, can this take too much effort to take the information or the data off this, the logs, uh, or is it of low value not required? So for me, I would look at it and say, well, what about the PC and the server and the network logs, right? So in this particular example, if it's all on the same side and it's all quite accessible to us, well, would it be quite easy to retrieve that information? So the level of effort in this case would be potentially low because it's all happening within our little area, our little local area network right here, which is between a single host and a file server and a bit of traffic that goes in between that. Now, if this was on a grander scale, you'll have to revisit this, but this is just me keeping things a little bit more simple and easy. Now, the same thing is true as we looked at this, the PC, like the, the laptop in use. Now let's look at the server. So the server is also the subject of potential evidence in this case. So let's look at the value Well, the value in this case would be quite high because it's also the subject. Again, the logs and the memory are quite high. So I'm going to put a high component here for both. So logs plus the memory because obviously the devices are on. Uh, the volatility information is quite high and then retrieving the level of effort to retrieve the logs from that server may be low as well because I've got access to it and then I don't need to go through any third parties to retrieve that information should it be a, a service provider or any, any external entity. So that's pretty much done for the server. Now let's look at our network traffic as well. So network traffic between that PC, the server, uh, and obviously the, the details that go in between that. So but this component, I would say, well, the, the details here would be quite high as well uh, if we're looking at the value because it was subjective to our investigation. Uh, there will be a high component as well across the logs and the memory. And again, it will also be quite low when we have to get or obtain those logging information as well. So. Again, the PC will have high, uh, and then finally the network logs themselves or the network traffic will help us prioritize the data or prioritize the data, I should say, um, by collecting it first, right? By not missing out on the logs or overriding themselves or the devices powering off, we're not losing any memory of any information across the scope there. So that's how I would categorize that. I would make a little bit of a game plan. I would have the value. What value is the device bringing? What's the value of the nature of the assessment itself? So what was involved? And then I would look at the volatility because volatility can be quite trivial based on if it's powered off, powered on. We want things powered on as well because we can we can search that memory function as well. 
uh, and then obviously the level of effort it takes to retrieve that logging information. So uh, that's pretty much it for this video as we've covered the, the basics of uh, the forensic process of identification. So we've looked at the different parts of the identification process and again, how we go away and start identifying the assets for potential forensic investigation. I hope you've enjoyed this video and see you all in the next video. Thank you for viewing.